One of the critical things we want to resolve in structural geology is the direction in which things that have displaced have moved. And uh, this is captured by the concept of kinematics. And we're familiar with this because of considerations of fault zones. So in the case of the fault here, we can answer the question, which way has it moved, by looking at the offset of markers between hanging wall and football. In the case here, we can see that the blue um, set of entry rocks here in the hanging wall have been downthrown, so it's a normal fault. Well, what we're going to do here is take these ideas into deeper environments where shear zones represent the zones of relative displacement. And the question we want to ask is, which way has my shear zone moved? Well, just like the fault, if we can match markers across the shear zone, we can establish the movement direction. In the case of the shear zone in our cartoon here, we could match those black uh, intrusions across the shear zone and establish that it too has moved as a normal fault or as a normal shear. But what happens if we can't recognize these offsets? Well, that's what we're going to look at here. We're going to use objects that are classified as shear criteria. And really what that means is the sense of shear criteria. In the case of our cartoon, whether we're dealing with a uh, thrust sense or a normal sense shear zone. Well, the first thing to think about is where do we look for these structures? And then having made that decision, we need to think about what we're going to look for. And we'll look at two types of feature, fabrics and objects. So let's start off with this question about where do we look for shear criteria. So here we have uh, some geologists in the field looking at some platy rocks that form part of a shear zone. And we can see that sort of thing cartooned up in the block diagram. This material is formed by shear. So it's an LS tectonite. By that I mean it's got a lineation, a stretch lineation, which is the L part of that term. And it's got a foliation or schistosity, a planar fabric. Um, which is the S part of the LS tectonite. So we need to have an LS tectonite. And the key point about that is that the stretch lineation gives us an axis of displacement, a transport axis. But the question we need to ask is, what's the direction of movement along this axis? As we've got it set up here, the block diagram is shown with those arrows as moving top to the left. But we haven't provided any information to justify that. So where are we going to look for the criteria? Well, there's a couple of places on the side faces that we could go for. Well, we want to look side on. So don't look down the lineation. We cross out that eyeball. Look side on to the lineation. So here's a workflow. What you need to do, first of all, is to make sure we're looking at a shear zone. So we need to make sure we've got an LS tectonite with a planar fabric as well as a linear fabric. We're going to look onto the foliation to identify the stretching lineation, and that will give us our transport axis, and we'll measure both the foliation and the lineation. Next, having established those two rock features, we'll look side on to the foliation, perpendicular to the lineation, in the direction shown on the block diagram. And it's onto that face that we'll observe and interpret the shear criteria, and eventually then we'll put all those pieces of information together to get an idea of the kinematics of our shear zone. So the question is, what are we going to observe on this face that will define the sense of shear experienced by the rocks? Well, here's uh, an outcrop of a shear zone. It's the classic shear zone from Castle Adair on North Uist. And we can identify the sense of shear in this shear zone by looking at the bending of the foliation. And it's the bending from the margins that's the best criteria we've got. But what happens if we can't see the margin or the bending? It might be because the shear zone is so large that we are like an ant on this outcrop. And we have to make do with local small scale observations. So let's start off thinking about fabrics alone in shear zones. We're going to start off looking at, first of all, at a type of fabric relationship called SC. And we'll unpack that as we go. So let's deform our array of circular markers into ellipses. So we've sheared our rocks. Now, this is showing homogeneous strain. And it's actually really difficult to do anything with homogeneous strain. But actually, on a small scale, strain is never homogeneous. Let's zoom in and think about what might be going on between these objects. 
And let's say it's heterogeneous in detail. So these objects are relatively stiff and are deforming like ellipses, but their tails are getting strung out, as you can see on the diagram. So this gives localized zones of slightly more intense deformation picked up by those uh, peach colored strands that are running horizontally across the image. These are higher strain zones. The long axis of the grains are defined by those blue bars. Now, in a rock, the long axis of the grain-shaped fabric defines the cleavage or schistosity. So that's schistosity. Little mini shear zones we can think of running through like this. Now these fabrics were first described from outcrops in France. We're going to look at them in a minute. And the terminology comes from the French for shear. Shear in French is cisaillement. So the S stands for schistosité and the C stands for cisaillement, SC fabrics. Well, let's go to the outcrops that inspired this terminology. And it's a deformed granite in the South American shear zone in Brittany. And we can pick out the long axes of those white objects, which are felspar. They run like that. So that's the schistosity. But running across the outcrop from top right to sort of bottom left is a fabric which I'll just pick out like this, which are little shears, and they're mostly localised on the weaker minerals, which are largely biotite, which gives the rock the dark colour in those seams. So that is SC, and you'll notice that the cisaillement, the shear fabrics, are systematically oblique to the long axis of the felspars, the schistosity. So it implies that sense of shear, top to the left. So here's our cartoon displaying that relationship. So those are SC fabrics, and they form, if you like, on the margins of shear zones or in areas where the total shear strain is not totally intense. So we've still got this obliquity between the shape fabric and the shears. What happens if the strain increases? Well, these are highly sheared rocks. They're marlinites from along the Moyne Thrust uh, in northern Scotland. Let's think about fabrics at higher strain. Well, at higher strain, the foliation becomes parallel to the shear plane, something like that. So if we think about a deck of cards just slipping past itself, then the card planes are the shear plane. But it's really difficult, of course, to work out which way things are moving if all you see are parallel slipping foliations. But let's imagine in here that something begins to happen and that strain localises onto patches that are slightly easier slip than the rest of the card deck. Well, if you have two patches like this, they'll try and join up along a zone like this. They'll link as a step so that with increasing shear, displacement will transfer from the upper one on the right down to the lower one on the left like a little normal fault. And it will deform the slightly earlier formed foliation in that sense. These are called shear bands and they're like small normal faults. And like small normal faults, we can use the offset and deflection of the foliation to determine the sense of movement. So that's a shear band. Let's look at an example from a high strain zone. Here we are. This is from a structure called the frontal pennine thrust, a major shear in the French Alps. And we can recognize these carbonate marlinites with the coin on for scale. But if you look at the fabric in here, which is largely inclined from top left to bottom right, in detail, it's sort of slightly wavy. We can pick it out a bit and then identify these zones of slightly higher shearing shown by these grey elongate shapes or lenses and the sense of shear they represent shown by little red arrows. So we can identify lots of little shears of localised tweaks, if you will, within the shear zone, which portray the overall sense of shear, which is something like that. So shear bands are another fabric element that we can identify in shear zones to tell us the sense of shear. Here's another example from a shear zone that lies at the base of some folds in a place called Champsaur, uh, again in the French Alps, not so far from the outcrops we were just looking at. Zoom in a bit and we can see these uh, slaty rocks are sheared over um, like this. So we have the pre-existing or slightly earlier fabric shown in yellow deflecting and intensifying into a higher strain zone picked up by that pink streak. 
Again, you can identify that bend in and out of the zone, which implies that sense of movement. So the little shear here is implying a top to the left, and overall we would imply a top to the left for this detachment system. So again, fabrics to tell us the sense of shear. Both shear bands and SC fabrics rely on us identifying zones of slightly higher strain within the overall fabric. But in practice, it's actually really quite difficult to tell which we're dealing with. Are we dealing with a shear band or an SC fabric? From a kinematic point of view, it doesn't matter. They both give the same solution of shear sense. And if you're not sure, it may be better anyway to use the non-genetic term, extensional crenulation cleavage. In other words, we have a schistosity that is wavy, crenulated by either the shear band or the little cesimal surfaces. Well, that's fabrics. Let's look at this rock here, which is an algon nice. It's got those large algon of felspar that you can see sprinkling through the outcrop. There's also an intense fabric developed in the rock coming through like this. It actually generates a sort of a, uh, an SC type fabric uh, picked out uh, by the arrows. So it giving us a top to the right sense of shear. But let's see what's happening to the felspars because the felspars are more competent than the surrounding material. They're behaving quasi rigidly, but it's not to say they're not deforming. They fracture, or at least some of them do, into these rather spectacular little bookshelf type patterns. Just think about how they develop. So we've got a cartoon here which shows an intact felspar shown by that sort of greeny teal colour. Let's imply a shear sense through it and the fractures will develop like this. And the fractures will slip to create these little rotating bookshelf patterns like this, giving a sense of shear like that. So fractured class are a great shear sense indicator. Well, here's another class in the shear zone. This one's a bit bigger. Notice the scale bar there's 10 centimeters. And we're looking at a large block of pegmatitic granite that's found itself caught up in a shear zone. There's the granite shape in here. And if we back away, the fabric in the surrounding shear zone has that pattern. So in other words, it wraps into the pod of granite, but it has a rather special shape. Let's consider a little cartoon here of an inclusion, a lump within the shear zone that's going to shear in the direction of the arrows. And it's going to spin. So as it spins, the fabric around that rotating object is entrained and also spins with it to create a fold structure like that. So there's a diagnostic fold pattern which portrays the sense of rotation that the object has experienced. And we can identify a similar thing in our tracing of our pegmatite block in the shear zone up on the left there. These folds on the sides of the rotating object are called flanking folds. There they go. And it's the sense of deflection of the fabric as they come around the flanking folds that portrays the sense of rotation experienced by the object like this. So if the object that we're looking at here is rotated clockwise, the sense of shear here is top to the right. It's a rolling inclusion. So while we're here, we might as well see where this piece of pegmatites come from. And it's one of a series of broken pieces of a pegmatite sheet. Here is one of these pegmatite sheets. And you can see the, as you go towards the top of the picture, that it's boudinaged and pulled out. Well, we can use the shape of this granite sheet to tell us something about the sense of shear. Let's bring out the granite sheet and the foliation. Let's just take the photograph away. So there we have the granite pegmatite in pink running across the sketch and the fabric orientation shown by the uh, blue traces. So let's set up a little simple cartoon here to show how a pre-existing sheet would deform in a sense of shear that you can see picked out by those arrows. And we can track the deformation uh, with reference to that circular marker, which will obviously become elliptical as the shear is imposed. So let's impose some shear. Here we go. 
and our elliptical marker is now there with that long axis set up and we go around and around and notice what's happening to the object the granite sheet it's become folded and the limbs attenuated and one limb the short limb thickened up so to think about how this object's developed let's just ghost in the original orientation of the strain ellipse as a circle but also of the original orientation of the marker and you can see that the marker that has been strung out into the thin narrow limbs has been rotated out of its original orientation in the direction shown by those little arrows they're rotating clockwise so why is the fold developed with a short squashed limb and a very elongate pair of limbs well let's think about the strain ellipse and as the ellipse has developed the long axis of that ellipse and anything oriented parallel to the, or near parallel to the long axis of the ellipse has been stretched so the limb that was poking out in that direction has become stretched out and thinned whereas the limb that is across the direction of the short axis has become squashed and flattened therefore the in the outcrop we've got stretching of the limb going off to the top there and that's manifest by boudinage and the short limb of our fold structure through here has become squashed and thickened so that betrays the orientation of the strain ellipse we can relate the boudinage of course to the stretching of the limb in the original cartoon we just had ductile thinning but in this case in nature the granite sheet has behaved more competently the surrounding material has actually broken into a series of boudins so we can use the behavior of sheets in our shear zone in this case of a granitic pegmatite to define the sense of shear once one of these boudins becomes detached we can use the flanking folds to determine the sense of shear like we did just now so the shear sense of our shear zone again is top to the right as it was within our rotating inclusion of the isolated block of pegmatite let's move down scale now and let's look at what's happening in some of the ground mass around here and these rocks into which these pegmatites have been intruded include these rather spectacular garnets so that's a garnet porphyroblast there and you can notice that it's mantled or rimmed by that uh, pale material which is a rim of quartz and felspar so it's a porphyroblast with a rim well rimmed inclusions represent great shear criteria and again we can cartoon this up so what we've done in this cartoon is set the garnet as the green circle in the middle and that's going to rotate in the direction shown by the arrows there and it's surrounded by a rim of weaker material that's going to get entrained out into the shear zone and that entrainment may pull it out in that sort of direction creating a pair of wings on either side of the rotating porphyroblast but if the rotation continues to occur the wings will get entrained and also fold something like this as they spin round and spin some more and they can even keep spinning right the way round as the porphyroblast rotates around and around and around so rotated porphyroblasts are a great shear sense indicator so that was a brief overview of the types of structures we can use to define the sense of shear in shear zones. We've seen that we need to look side on to our shear zone perpendicular to the stretch lineation to use these criteria to define the movement direction. We've used fabrics, SC fabrics and shear bands. And we've also looked at an array of inclusions which rotate in the shear zone. And it's the sense of rotation that gives us the sense of shear. But overall, the message really is to use many different criteria. Individually, they may be quite difficult to interpret. But if you use a variety of these features, or at least those that are preserved in the rock, you can make a decision as to what the sense of shear experienced by your shear zone might have been. Shear criteria.